The Answer. Listen to AM560 The Answer online at 560theanswer.com on the AM560 mobile app, on your Alexa-powered smart speaker, and on TuneIn, iHeart, and on Odyssey. This is Chicago's Morning Answer with Dan Proft and Amy Jacobson on AM560 The Answer. Top of the morning, Dan and in for Amy J. This morning, former ABC7 political reporter Charles Thomas. Uh, Charles, uh, Jason Furman of Harvard, former Obama economic uh, guru, chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors under one President Obama, mm-hmm. tweeting, uh-oh, some of that inflation slowdown that people, including me, were excited about might have just been a seasonal adjustment quirk. Core CPI, Consumer Price Index, for the last three months of the year goes from 3.1% to 4.3% with the new seasonal factors that the Bureau of Labor Statistics just released. So maybe we're not out of the woods yet when it comes to prices uh, declining to uh, pre pandemic levels and what that will mean for uh, the availability of credit and economic growth and employment and all of the other factors in our economy. For more on this, we're pleased to be joined by John Tammany, editor at realclearmarkets.com, director of the Center for Economic Freedom at FreedomWorks, author of The Money Confusion, How Illiteracy About Currencies and Inflation Sets the Stage for the Crypto Revolution. John, thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, Jason Furman says he went to, he's a professor at Harvard. Uh-oh. You better not cross him, John. So what would what do you have to say to Jason Furman? Oh, I feel if you looked it up, you'd find that no one alive has rebutted Jason Furman more than I. So, uh, wow. uh so if I cross him, it won't be problematic. I've done it numerous times. Uh, to blame, say that rising prices cause inflation is like saying that suntans cause the sun to shine. At best, it reverses causation. <laughs> post hoc uh, ergo prompter hoc fallacy is what you're saying. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. It's, it, you know, prices go up and down for all sorts of reasons. Um, that is a market economy. If a price is going up, uh, Super Bowl tickets last night cost between ten and forty thousand. When I first went to a game in nineteen eighty seven for the Super Bowl, they cost a little over a hundred. Is that inflation? No, that's just a lot more demand for something that is limited in supply. That's not inflation. Um, if you had a cell phone back in eighty seven, you were most likely someone who was extraordinarily rich. Now they're commonplace. Is that deflation? No, that's just productivity. Prices go up and down, and so that the CPI is moving around, I don't think means very much. Uh, to me, inflation remains a devaluation of the unit, as in our dollar, and we haven't seen that in recent years. And so I go back again to what I've said on your show before. To me, the higher prices are a statement of the obvious. You can't shut down the global economy and eviscerate remarkably sophisticated global cooperation and expect prices to remain the same. They were going to be higher by nature. Right, but then then the question is, uh, uh, when when can we expect uh, supply to um, meet, come come closer to meeting demand and see prices reduced? Because it's not... Uh, in controversy that uh, people, middle-income people, for example, are paying more from their take-home pay to the essentials of life, like groceries? Well, the first thing I would say is this is not a supply problem. Supply and demand, by definition, match each other. We know that. That's just basic. Well, You're a Bastiat fan, so am I. By definition, and if, and if a, there's a, a limited supply... Market. Yeah. Well, no, but okay, but... In, if there's a limited supply of, of, I don't know, chicken breasts such that they're higher, as a rule, there's less demand for other things. And so it's important to point out that right now inventory within businesses has never been higher. If you're Dell Computer, if you're Nike, if your business is like that, you have lots of excess. And so prices must fall if prices are going up. What I keep arguing is that how we got to such low prices in February of 2020 
was a consequence of immense and wildly sophisticated global cooperation. Why did Henry Ford successfully make the car accessible to most anyone? He did by dividing up labor in specialized fashion. Well, suddenly that specialized division of labor was eviscerated. You can't rebuild that overnight. And so for when politicians say, well, hey, it's inflation, to me that's more offensive than Obama saying you didn't build that. You expect them to build the amazing thing that they built, rebuild it overnight? I mean, please. Of course prices are higher. It's not demand and supply. It's that we have to get back to where we were, which was a miracle. Now, you um, place, you, you uh, suggest routinely that the Fed's uh, uh, control over the economy is vastly overstated. Um, but the problem I see is that... Um, the, you know, the, the uh, trading markets disagree with you and the performance of the trading markets is impactful in terms of the sort of liquidity in the economy uh, and people's willingness to invest, willingness to How do the spend, trading markets spend. disagree with me? How do they, how do they disagree with me? Well, well because, they play, the, because they place a lot of importance on Jay Powell's pronouncements, don't they? Well, you, you say that, but back in the 2000s, the Fed was aggressively cutting rates and stocks were plummeting. Uh, back in 2007, 2008, the Fed was aggressively cutting rates and stocks plummeted. So I don't, I, I don't see what you're saying. If central banks could do as, as it's assumed they can do, just stimulate markets, why is the Japan stock market exponentially higher than ours? Because they've been at zero for decades. Yet, in fact, their stock market is still roughly half of where it was in 1989. Um, if the Fed could shrink, if, if the Fed could cut rates and just cause the stock market to rally, well, by that measure, GM or actually GE and AOL and Yahoo and, and Enron and, and, and Tyco would still be some of the most valuable companies. Because the Fed was aggressively cutting rates back then. Where are they today? Well, and so, no, I well think- but I mean, those are, I understand one-off companies, but, but I mean, I guess my large point, you, so you don't, you don't think that um, the, uh, all the attention paid to those Fed board meetings and the, what the rate hike is going to, what, what was going to be in February and now what's going to be in March and is that going to be the last hike and so on and so forth, all the stuff that dominates the, uh, those investotainment shows on CNBC and so forth, that doesn't, that, that, that does, doesn't impact the decisions that, um, corporations make, the decisions that individual investors make, and uh, those decisions don't have ripple effects in terms of our, our growth? Well, someone's, the assumption is, oh, we'll see if the Fed cuts rates. Oh, yeah, stocks just go up. Think well, about what the, what the, oh, no, no, not no, exactly, that's, but that's not exactly okay, what I'm saying. That's kind, of, that's kind of what you're implying. So what you're saying is that half of the market knows what you know, but the other half is just blithely selling shares as though they don't know what you know. The thing, for every market, there's a seller and a buyer. And so this notion that the Fed can just stimulate stock market rallies by fiddling with rates presumes a level of information asymmetry that staggers the mind. Well, so, so, the- so, but, so but all, of, all of the Fed asset purchases over the last decade, you know, the quote-unquote quote, quote, quantitative easing, um, I mean, that doesn't create market distortions? That doesn't... Those... Well, I'm sure it does in treasuries and everything, but why would that... What, what would that have to do with economic growth? Japan's well, uh, had exponentially more uh, uh, quantitative easings over the years. Where's the stock market rally been? Where's the distortion been there? Well, well, I'm, so, I, well, I'm, it can be a distortion that goes either way. I'm just saying it's a distortion. I'm not saying that... I'm not saying that cut rates, market goes up. I'm saying that the Fed... Uh, the, the, the Fed uh, p- paternalism when it comes to markets matters based on what you see f- in terms of reaction to Fed policy from the markets. I mean, you were a wealth manager at Goldman, right? And Credit Suisse, you, you've been in the industry. So, so I mean, you, you the, like nothing, the Fed, what the Fed d- did or didn't do, these market interventions by uh, central bankers, you didn't pay any attention to those things? Uh, no, I, I thought it was a waste of time. But you see, when I was at Goldman, the Fed was aggressively cutting rates and stocks were falling just in, in, a, in a sickening way, such that most of the people there were laid off. And so this notion that, that the Fed can bail out markets and bail out Goldman Sachs, well, boy, I sure, I sure didn't witness it. The, the NASDAQ was in free fall, and so was the Dow. 
And I'm just saying if the Fed could prop up markets as is broadly assumed, we would be too poor to be having this conversation right now. Just think about what that would imply. It would imply that, that they could keep uh, the present in place. Well, see, in the year 2000, the most valuable company in the world was GE. The two most dominant uh, Internet companies were Yahoo and AOL. The best managed company in the world was Tyco. The smartest company in the world was Enron. How are those doing today? And so well, it's 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 my, no, but, but nobody's arguing it's the only variable. It's well, what well, I'm but, arguing is but, it's a no, variable. But, but they are. But, but well, Dan, okay, I'm not. Are. I'm not. And and I've been fighting. And, and the Wall Street Journal's editorial page. Oh yeah, you know the Fed's easy money policies. Oh well, that causes stocks to rise. No acknowledgement that central banks around the world have been doing the same thing with no similar rally. And no acknowledgement of a simple truth that because you said well it's, you can't just use one offs, but see one offs are what drive the market. What drove this market until recently? Five companies. Right. Uh, Facebook, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, uh, you can name the, the uh, uh, Apple. Are you going to tell me those companies were actually, they, they were kind of humdrum, but they had the Fed behind them. But see, those companies back in 2000, well, Apple was near bankruptcy. Google wasn't even public. Amazon was Amazon.org. So we have to either acknowledge that the U.S. is full of great companies, which is what I say, or we have to go the Obama route. That No, actually, the companies kind of suck, but uh, the, the Fed props them up. You didn't build I that. I that notion outright. Yeah. I mean, so, so, so then when you look at the market today, not that you're providing advice and counsel for in, investment purposes, but, I mean, what's your, what's your handle on the vitality of, uh, uh, of Fortune 1000 and what's your optimism or lack thereof in terms of where the American economy goes this year? Um, I'm always optimistic because the U.S. is full of the most enterprising people on Earth. It's always going to go up. My strong sense is that it's going is that this next rally, whenever that happens, is going to be companies that we've never heard of. Remember, not too long ago, the view was that Google had an impregnable monopoly. Uh, Chat GPT kind of blew that one out of the water. Right. And, and so, and so, what you and this is the source of the U.S. stock market's vitality. It's not the Fed. Oh my. God, the notion that J Jerome Powell and Ben Bernanke and those clowns could actually cause the smartest, deepest markets in the world to go up, to cause basically some investors to be stupid and sell while others buy, is just laughable. But what we do consistently see, and this is the source of, the, of, of stock market vitality, is that, we're, is that the greats are constantly being replaced by even better. And it, it, amazing to think that Facebook, which seemed impossible to beat, doesn't seem to be doing as well right now. Again, Google was caught flat-footed in the way that Microsoft, which was once thought to be a monopoly that couldn't be beat, was caught flat-footed by the smartphone, by the Internet itself. And so we're going to see it over and over again. And there's your rally. Not the Fed. Oh, my gosh. Why do, we, why do conservatives keep insulting the United States, the, the, these entrepreneurs, by saying the Fed makes all this happen, or even, even some of it? John Tamney, editor of RealClearMarkets.com, director of the Center for Economic Freedom at FreedomWorks, author of The Money Confusion, How Illiteracy About Currencies and Inflation Sets the Stage for the Crypto Revolution. John, thanks as always. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And he joined us on the Turnkey.pro answer line. The more you listen, the more you listen, the more you'll know. This is Chicago's Morning Answer. Morning Answer. On AM560, The Answer. This is Ryan Anderson, president of the Ethics and Public Policy Center for townhall.com. Why can't they just go to another baker? That's the question many are asking after the most recent setback for Jack Phillips. Several years ago, Jack won 7-2 to at the Supreme Court in a case involving his decision to not create custom wedding cakes celebrating same-sex relationships. Now he's lost at the Colorado Court of Appeals over a different cake, a happy gender transition cake with pink batter and blue frosting, meant to symbolize and celebrate someone who claims to be a woman on the inside, but a man on the outside. But the Colorado court ruled against Jack. We conclude that creating a pink cake with blue frosting is not inherently expressive. Baloney. The activist who asked for this particular cake went to Jack on purpose and told him what the cake was meant to express. That's why the activist won't go to another baker. They want Jack to bend the knee. At some point, the Supreme Court will need to put a stop to this. I'm Ryan Anderson.
Did you give up on your New Year's resolution already? You don't have to since you can lose a contractually guaranteed 20 to 40 plus pounds in only 40 days with NJ Diet. That's guaranteed weight loss. NJ Diet's scientific approach uses your hair, saliva, and blood work 